Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the Presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Andrew Johnson, and the focus is a mudsill. Now, a mudsill is a person of the lowest social order. Now, of course, in early 19th century America, the lowest social order, that would be black slaves. They had no rights whatsoever. Free blacks, not much better than that, but just above them, the poor white community. And this was also an impoverished group who had very little say in what was going on in their community. They were looked down upon, poor education, no economic prospects. This was the world that Andy Johnson was born into, December 29th, 1808 in Raleigh, North Carolina. His parents were Jacob and Mary Johnson, poor, illiterate. Jacob worked in a tavern. He was hoping, obviously, every day to get tips or even scraps of food to help take care of his family. This was a very tough life. The fact is, Andrew Johnson barely knew his father because he died at a very young age, and he died a hero. When uh, Johnson came across, the elder Johnson came across a couple of men drowning in some icy water. He didn't hesitate. He jumped in. He saved both men, but his own health was never the same again. He was dead within a year. Andrew Johnson was only three years old at the time. Now, his mother Mary thought, well, I'll get remarried. I'll bring in another uh, person in the family to probably do some work, maybe bring in some money. It didn't work out very well because Turner Daughtry was from that poor white community. He was uneducated. He couldn't really get work. It was just another mouth to feed. So ultimately, the only thing they could figure out to do with the boys was to try to get them to learn a trade. And in their teenage years, it was time to sign up as an apprentice. First, William Johnson, Andy's older brother, and then Johnson himself to follow. And they went and tracked down James Selby, who was the local tailor who agreed to bring them in. Now, the apprentice situation was fairly common at the time, and it seemed in many cases to work well both ways. The boys in this case got room and board, they learned a trade, and they learned it well. Selby was a good tailor, he taught them well, but he was a taskmaster, he worked them really hard, there was no extra income other than room and board for these folks, and no freedom, no freedom of movement. They had really under Selby's thumb at all times, and Johnson really bristled at this. Two things that did come out of this that were positive for Johnson. Number one, he learned how to be a tailor, and a good one, and this would really help him as the years went by. He also started to learn to read. Andrew Johnson did not have a single formal day of education his entire life. He didn't know the alphabet when he became an apprentice tailor, but some of the journeyman tailors started teaching him words that he would memorize. He kept bothering them because he knew at some point if he wanted to move up in the world, he needed to be able to read and write. That got started in the tailor shop of James Selby. But again, Johnson did not do well in this environment. And he was a bit of a wild boy, sometimes a bit of a prankster. And he was caught doing a prank about a year and a half into his apprenticeship. And he was afraid. He and his comrades who were sort of involved in this prank, they thought that Selby was really going to lower the boom on them. So what did they do? They decided to run. They were going to get rid of James Selby, start off on their own. So William Johnson, Andy's older brother, himself, a couple of the other boys escaped. They went 200 miles south into South Carolina, and they set up a tailor shop in an abandoned cabin in Lawrence, South Carolina. Andrew Johnson's only 15 years old at the time. Well, he had to grow up very quickly, obviously, in life, and part of that meant his first romance. And this was the young lady of Sarah Work that he fell for, and he fell hard, and within a few months, he was proposing marriage. That did not go so well because Work's family didn't want someone from this poor white community coming into their family, taking on the responsibilities to take care of their daughter. They didn't think he was up to it, and they said a flat-out no. At this point, Johnson was really distraught. He was far from home. Nothing was going well, and so he decided he's going to go back home and take his chances with James Selby, try to see if he could get his apprenticeship back. That was not a very good bet. He got back to Raleigh. He tracked down Selby, and Selby held a grudge. Selby not only said, no, I'm not bringing you back as an apprentice, I'm going to make it so you can't work in this state because I am not even going to release you from your apprenticeship. And he was signed up till he was 21 years old. And by law, no one else in the state could hire Andrew Johnson unless Selby let him go. So now Johnson had literally no prospects. What was he going to do? Well, he decided to hit the road again, and that meant this time going west. He was going to leave the state of North Carolina, venture into the Tennessee, the new state in Tennessee, and see what he could do there. He walked. He kind of rides every once in a while on a caravan, but mostly he walked about 500 miles before he finally found some work as a journeyman tailor in Columbia, Tennessee. 
This didn't last long either. He heard from home. His mother was completely destitute. She needed his help. What did he do? He quit that job, walked all the way back, picked up his mother and his stepfather, put their meager belongings into a small two-wheeled cart that was hitched to a blind pony. In this sad moment, they started heading west again, back into Tennessee to find work. This time they stopped in eastern Tennessee in the town of Greenville. And it was originally a little bit of work there for Johnson. And he also met a young lady by the name of Eliza McCardle, who actually found them an empty cabin where they could stay. But again, there was already a tailor in this town. And so there wasn't enough work for Johnson. The families decided to keep moving. But six months later, they found out that that tailor in Greenville, uh, Tennessee, closed up shop. There was an opening. Johnson skedaddled back. He planted himself there and he would be calling Greenville home the rest of his life. And he did it with Eliza McCardle. A couple of months after they got back from, uh, from being in the other parts of Tennessee, he and Eliza got married. He was 18. She was 17. They set up shop in a two room shack. The front room was the store, the shop for the tailor business. The back room was the living quarters. It was Eliza. It was Andrew Johnson. Within a couple of years, they had two kids, two more mouths to feed as well. Eliza was really key to the growth and stability of Andrew Johnson, not only in these formative years, but throughout his life. She was very much his rock, very much behind the scenes. She kind of ran the household, but she also tutored him. She had some education and she helped him learn to read, learn to write. She encouraged him to join the debate club at nearby Greenville College, and he did well there and he made some friends. Now, most of those friends were from the lower class, the plebeian class, the, the working folks within town, but that was fine with him. These were the people that he had mostly associated with, but he also was frustrated. He would look down upon by the elites in the community, and this would be a chip that he would have on his shoulder for the rest of his life, and it would certainly inform his political ideology for his life as well. Well, now we're up to 1829. He's 20 years old and had a couple of friends that they decided to shake things up a little bit. They were going to get involved in the political world, which was usually not even available to the plebeian class. But Johnson and his friends had an idea in mind. They were going to run for town council, but they weren't going to tell anybody to the last minute. This way, there was no sort of formal opposition against them, and they sort of flooded the town with their announcement. They got a lot of their friends and supporters to come out and vote, and sure enough, all three were elected. Once again, this was a clash in the council where the aristocrats, the elites of the community, looked down upon Johnson and his friends. He had that chip on his shoulder. He certainly wasn't going to let him down. And in fact, he keep, kept going on with his own constituents. He got reelected the next year, the year after that, and after that, he was elected mayor of Greenville, uh, Tennessee. This was really the first time in Johnson's life that things were really going well for him. He finally had a prominent position in the community. His tailor shop was going well. He was always looking for that next rung in his political life. Where could he go next? And the next rung for him, state legislature. And sure enough, he ran. And he ran on this populist campaign. This is the mid-1830s. It's the era of Andrew Jackson, who's now president of the United States. The populism, the working class were on the rise, particularly in the West. And Andrew Johnson was a great campaigner, fiery in his rhetoric on the campaign trail. And sure enough, he was elected to the state legislature. Didn't go so well. He had a lot to learn at this broader sense of responsibility. And one of the most important things to learn was to take care of his constituents. He was a very frugal man. He didn't like spending his own money. He didn't like spending other people's money. And so he voted no on a new road that was planned for the eastern part of Tennessee. In fact, it was going to go through Greenville and his constituents wanted that road. They used it against him at a re-election time, and he was not sent back to the state legislature. But Andy Johnson wasn't just going to take this lying down and go off and sulk. He actually doubled down on getting to know his community. His tailor shop became sort of the political hotbed of the community, where both the, his customers and also the tailors were engaged in political debate and political discussion all the time. Andrew Johnson listened. He participated. He made a lot of relationships within the town. And sure enough, he was back in the state legislature in 1839. At this stage, he had yet to actually declare himself formally as a Democrat. He'd always lean that way, the Jacksonian policies. But you had the Democrats, you had the Whigs. Where did Andrew Johnson stand? Well, in 1840, he decided to hold an event. He invited all the leading Democrats from around that part of the state, and he gave a fiery, populist, three-hour address that made it clear 
where he stood on the rights of the working class to try to rise up and his support for that. He gained a lot of support. In fact, he was named as a delegate to the National Democratic Convention that year. He stumped for era Martin Van Buren, who was running for president of the United States, and he was rewarded with a seat in the state Senate. People were taking notice of Andrew Johnson, the people and the press. The Democrat-leaning Nashville Union said of Johnson that Johnson of Green made one of the most eloquent, powerful, and convincing arguments which we have ever heard from the lips of man. We consider him, in point of talent, a decided, as decidedly among the first men of the state. He is just the man for a crisis, bold, prompt, and energetic. No responsibility can intimidate, and no obstacles discourage him. Things were looking up for Andrew Johnson. He had a little money in his pocket, and with that, he actually bought the first two slaves that he would own. Not uncommon, certainly for plantation owners in the South, but also for the plebeian class who had enough money who could afford it. He, he actually procured two slaves. He had no problem with the institution. He would later say that he saw slavery as neither a moral, social, or political evil, but he saw it as a right a right protected by the Constitution of the United States. This was a common understanding in not only in the South, but even in other parts of the state at the time, no controversy with procuring slaves for Andrew Johnson. As for Johnson, well, the mudsill had come a long way, especially in the eyes of the working class. These were his people. And of course, at this point, Andrew Johnson was just getting started. And that is a mudsill from the life of Andrew Johnson. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.